Today on this episode of The Crossover, we will be discussing the future of integrative medicine and cancer care with world-renowned New Age movement expert, Dr. Deepak Chopra. Learn how integrative medicine is advancing and synergizing with traditional cancer care in an effort to improve the quality of life and disease outcomes in oncology patients. Much more on this episode of The Crossover. Well, happy afternoon, everyone. We are here again talking with one of my good friends and colleagues, Dr. Deepak Chopra, uh, the man who literally needs no introduction, but will do one anyway. Uh, he is a world-renowned integrative medicine expert. Um, he is founder of the Chopra Foundation, Chopra Global, as well as professor of family medicine and senior scientist at the Gallup Organization. Author of over 90 books, translated into over 43 languages, including numerous New York Times bestsellers. Time Magazine described him as one of the top 100 heroes and icons of the century. Larry King has described his work as some of the most important of the decade, and the Wall Street Journal declared his books must-reads for your career. Um, he has also been recognized as one of the top 100 most influential people in healthcare and fitness. 17th most influential thinker in the world and actually number one in medicine. That's truly amazing. Here today to discuss the integration between Eastern and Western medicine and how integrative medicine plays a role in cancer care, which is absolutely a vital question. I think moving forward, uh, that is something that's really going to change the face of cancer. So look forward to listening to uh, Dr. Chopra's input on this very critical topic. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you again. It's lovely to be with you. Ricardo. So just very uh, basic for the lay person, what in your opinion, what does integrative medicine mean? Okay, so you know, I started my career in the 1970s, first in internal medicine, and then in endocrinology, and then in neuroendocrinology. And in the 70s, uh, radio immunoassay was a new technique, and I was working with some of the best minds in the world, including Seymour Reichlin, who was the president of the Endocrine Society. And uh, he is now 97, by the way, and still teaching. Uh, when he has time, he takes sabbatical, come to New York, and he's an amazing person. But in the 70s, we were looking at, because of radio amino acid, we were looking at molecules uh, for the first time, uh, looking at how they acted. Molecules like serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, opiates, and many others. And one day, one of my colleagues, who later on uh, went to become the chief of chemistry at the NIH, she said, you know, these molecules are the molecules of emotion. And something clicked in my mind and said, this is the connection between the mind and body, these molecules. And so she wrote a book, uh, became a bestseller. I wrote the foreword and we had the birth of what we call mind-body medicine. How states like anger, hostility, guilt, shame, depression lead to uh, changes in biology such as excessive cortisol and adrenaline and inflammation and how um, experiences like empathy and compassion and love and joy and uh, equanimity or peace lead to the opposite uh, homeostasis self-regulation of the body and decrease in inflammation in any case this was the birth of uh, mind-body medicine and then it became very clear that it's not just mind and body it's other lifestyle things mind body is of course important but sleep is important and uh, you know it's right now we know that lack of sleep is the number one cause of premature death from cardiovascular disease and many other disorders alzheimer's because during sleep uh, amyloid is flushed out of the system but sleep also brings about self-regulation removal of toxins etc stress management in general something that is new it's called the polyvagal theory which says that the vagus nerve counteracts uh, the sympathetic overdrive that is associated with stress so we started looking at vagal stimulation 
through various techniques, yoga, breathing, tai chi, qigong, martial arts, but also certain maneuvers, uh, usually referred to as interoception, which means you learn how to regulate your autonomic nervous system. These are practices that come from ancient wisdom traditions. So vagal stimulation, the role of emotions and relationships, uh, restoration of biological rhythms, and uh, we had the birth of what we call integrative medicine. Now it's going a little bit beyond that because uh, integrative medicine is not looking at a deeper aspect of our awareness, which spiritual traditions call the soul. That's not a medical term or a biological term, but cognitive scientists uh, are now recognizing that there is an awareness that is prior to the activity of the mind. So the awareness of a thought is not a thought, it's the awareness of the thought. And that led to this whole revolution called mindfulness and its benefits. So right now, I my work is moving into the area of longevity and health span because less than 5% of disease-related gene mutations are fully penetrant and that they guarantee the disease. The remaining 95 plus percent and all disease, not just cancer, but all disease. Cancer, of course, we know if you have somebody has a BRCA gene, they are going to get cancer. And even for that, soon there's gene editing. So we'll be able to cut and paste genes the same way we cut and paste emails, which is amazing. But that will only affect less than 5%. The rest is still related to mind-body interactions and integrative medicine. That's sorry for the long answer. No, I mean, that's that's that was very comprehensive and it kind of gives a great background. You know, in your opinion, how should integrative medicine, which is what you just described, how should that dovetail with traditional cancer therapies? Well, traditional cancer therapy, uh, as we now know, has actually also progressed a lot in the last 50 years. So we used to have... Uh, uh, radiation and chemotherapy is the main aspects of uh, cancer therapy. But now, as you know, there's immunotherapy and immune uh, modulation and genetics that is being identified. You can precisely identify the genes, but then there's the whole role of epigenetics. So in cancer therapy, um, there's room now for epigenetic modulation through uh, lifestyle. Uh, that means that cancer chemotherapy um, can and radiation and immunotherapy can be enhanced if we give the body a chance to self-regulate and reduce inflammation. As you know, inflammation is a common factor in everything, almost every chronic disease. And now our meta-analysis at the research we do at the Chopra Foundation also shows that actually um, lifestyle is, uh, measures are very important in cancer chemotherapy or cancer therapy in general. And we are actually now, uh, Ricardo, I might need your help on this. We are developing an AI called Digital Deepak that will help people going through chemotherapy or radiation or any kind of cancer therapy, because frankly speaking, you're a busy guy and other oncologists are very busy. They don't have time to address certain concerns about mortality, mm -hmm. about fear of death, about lack of sleep, about sexual impotence that can be a part of the therapy in some cases. So if you have a digital machine that can actually be their companion as they're going through um, these treatments that will enhance. And we are already in the progress of developing an AI that will be a companion to people going through cancer treatment and even post-surgical recovery, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's an amazing idea because I totally agree with you that in the for 99% of patients, the holistic approach doesn't really exist. It's very traditional. And everything that you're mentioning that is so important kind of gets left to the wayside. So would be happy to help with that digital Deepak. That's a, that's a revolutionary idea. You had mentioned the importance of inflammation and how that leads to so many downstream effects. 
how should oncologists evaluate inflammation and how can it be reduced in certain cancer patients? Well, inflammation is the common is the common factor, not only in cancer but all chronic illness, and is very frequent frequently associated with stress, with fear, and also with uh, um, with just any form of anxiety. So when we were, during the pandemic, we were looking at, we did a meta-analysis of who was actually getting sick. You know, the elderly people who got sick from COVID, some died, some <clears throat> suffered immense, uh, you know, morbidity. They all had risk factors such as chronic disease or metabolic syndrome or diabetes or whatever, but they also had inflammation. They also had depression. In the younger people who got COVID, and 19 and suffered from it, there were what were called inflammatory storms. So inflammation goes along with all these things. And today we can measure them. Cytokines are the, the markers. Um, you know, when I was training, it would be C-reactive protein and that's all we would do or ESR. Uh, but today there are very precise um, cytokine measurements that can be measured in any patient, and I think that should be part of the routine workup. And then the most effective things that reduce inflammation are anti-inflammatory diets, like say the Mediterranean diet, but also, as I mentioned earlier, the vagal stimulation, which has been ignored by the way. Everybody knows about the sympathetic nervous system, but very few people talk about the parasympathetic nervous system, which is now referred to as the rest, restore and renew part of our autonomic nervous system. And you can learn to stimulate the vagus nerve uh, through various means, through actually when you smile, the vagus nerve uh, gets stimulated. When you sing or tone or chant, it gets stimulated. When uh, you meditate, it gets stimulated. During, with martial arts, it gets, uh, or yoga, it gets stimulated. But uh, we are also looking at devices so I'm now uh, working with the, with a company that has a small device that looks like an AirPod, the kind of thing you use when you use your iPhone, but it stimulates the auricular branch of the vagus nerve. You could be playing golf or you could be having a talk conversation or giving grand rounds, and there's a mild stimulation going on wow. of the auricular branch. And then you can monitor it through your iPhone by looking at heart rate variability. So, you know, everything I'm saying is now measurable. We put in, actually, I worked with the Fitbit two years ago on introducing some techniques um, live. And we had 1.3 billion hits. That's a, wow. su such a huge interest in also artificial intelligence, deep learning system. So, the treatment actually can be personalized and it is predictive. And the, the, the machines, the AI machines and the deep learning systems actually learn how much you slept, what your stress levels are, what triggers you, what diet you ate, et cetera. And then it can intervene in real time. So I think the future of treatment, including cancer, will be more precise, more predictable, preventable also, participatory in a pro process. But in many cases, you know, we've all seen remissions. We've all seen patients uh, who get the same treatment, see the same oncologists, have the same disease, but they have variable outcomes. Some people die, some people recover completely. It's a bell-shaped curve. So why is it a bell-shaped curve? Because no one person reacts exactly the same way to a treatment. But with AI and artificial intelligence and deep learning and looking at a person's daily lifestyle habits, you can personalize and intervene in real time. Yeah, and we have the same issue in terms of brain cancer. You know, they fall under one group. The treatment tends to be very uniform. But like you said, every brain cancer patient is different. So certainly targeted therapy, patient-specific treatment, that is the future of cancer care. Now, you mentioned earlier stress and how important that is. And obviously, cancer as a diagnosis inherently causes stress. Treatment causes stress. 
how do you break this feedback cycle where where they where the diagnosis and the treatment causes stress stress leads to worsening progression increased inflammation cancer progression potentially how do you break that stress in something so inherently stressful well you know i think the diagnosis of cancer could be called a nocebo uh, like you know you have placebos you have nocebos you say if you you know in australia i've once encountered a custom called pointing the bone in the aborigines so you know, uh, if you had an enemy in this Aborigine tribe, you went to your witch doctor and you said, he's my competitor, he's my enemy, can you do something? And so the witch doctor would take a kangaroo bone, dance around a fire, uh, recite some Aborigine mantras and would tell his customer, go point this bone to your enemy. Within 24 hours, the enemy would start getting uh, nausea and vomiting. 48 hours would get dehydrated. And within a week, sometimes would die. So actually, this custom of pointing the bone was outlawed in Australia because amongst the Aborigines, it is murder with a lethal weapon, even though you're doing nothing. Now, when you tell a patient you have cancer, you have so many years to live, it's pointing the bone actually it acts as a nocebo so i would advise every oncologist say you know you have to be honest about the diagnosis but be sure that you don't actually influence the patient by giving them a, a distinct prognosis because again survival is a best bell shape curve uh, some people go completely into remission. So you sh if I know the average temperature in New York for a year, I don't know what the temperature is right now. Or if I know the average income of a person in Miami, uh, I don't know what your income is, even though you live in Miami. So, you know, prognosis is, is, is a very difficult thing to, to give to a patient because it actually applies to a demographic, a group, but not necessarily to the individual patient. So with as much honesty as possible, we tell the patient, this is the diagnosis. This is how we treat it. The prognosis may or may not apply to you. And we should do everything to, to make you fully recover. And there's no such thing as false hope. The false hope is an oxymoron. Either you have hope, or you don't have hope. Now, if you don't have hope, you're going to release stress hormones, cortisol, etc. If you have hope, then you're going to release the opposite. You're going to, you know, uh, if you have peace and hope and equanimity, and we can give you many techniques to do that, then you will help facilitate your recovery. And there's so much progress that many cancers are not actually diagnosis of death anymore they are uh, many cancers are being treated as chronic illness and so you know and, and that includes things like prostate cancer and many kinds of brain tumors also that once you do the required treatment people can have a very good prognosis you and i've shared a patient or two where there was complete recovery particularly right. Adenomas and things like that, you know, and people have to be educated. That's the most important thing. Yeah, I mean, I would say that I I certainly never do numbers, and my whatever I tell my residents and fellows is you never want to steal a patient's hope. That's it. Like you said, you want to be honest, you want to mm -hmm. be very frank, but at the same point, you don't know what's going to happen in the future, and you don't want to mislead them and tell them what's going to happen when in reality you don't know, and then you're robbing them of their hope. Exactly. Exactly. I want to talk a little bit about becoming metahuman because that's a major focus of yours. And that's critical, obviously, in someone who's dealing with a diagnosis like cancer. How should cancer patients master reality, reframe their existence and achieve happiness when they're dealing with such a life threatening diagnosis? The idea of metahuman is to understand that once you break out of your conditioned mind, there's a deeper reality, which we call pure consciousness. So the conditioned mind is what happens 
when a baby learns language. You, you see any baby, it's full of curiosity, it's full of wonder, it's full of surprise, it's full of love, it's full of affection, attention, appreciation, and, and joy. That is our original state. But then because of our conditioning, um, uh, which is economic conditioning or racial conditioning or ethnic conditioning or national conditioning or religious conditioning, there's a lot of conditioning that recycles through millennia. And so we become creatures of habit, not knowing that there's a deeper reality, which is self-regulating. So pure awareness, which is minus the conditioning, is a deeper awareness, which is self-regulating, self-organizing, and self-evolving. Our autonomic nervous system is actually controlled by that deeper awareness. So right now, if I asked you, what are you doing to control your blood pressure? The answer is nothing. What are you doing to control your immune system or endocrine system? The answer is nothing. The only thing you can do is interfere with it. And when you interfere with it, then you'll get inflammation and all these other things. So teaching people to be meta-human is teaching them to go and become the observers of their mind. And as they observe their mind, there's a clear realization that they're not their mind. The mind is like clouds that come across the sky and awareness is like the sky itself. The sky never changes, but the clouds come and go. So learning to observe your thoughts is one way of uh, um, encountering the metahuman, the pure mind within you. Now, Recently, I've become involved in research around, around psychedelics. So when people go through an experience with a psychedelic like ketamine or uh, psilocybin or MDMA, um, they have a decrease in the activity of their uh, default mode network, which is the neural correlate of the conditioned or ego mind. So as the ego mind and the neural correlate, the default mode network, otherwise called DFM, default mode, DMN, default mode network, as it cools down, then everything cools down, like the amygdala cools down, et cetera, and people begin to self-regulate. So uh, right now I'm working with a number of psychedelic researchers on microdosing and the effects on inflammation and actually going beyond the conditioned mind. There are many other processes, but this is something new. And, uh, you know, it will take a little while for people to catch on, but we can see the buzz around um, psilocybin research right now, ketamine, assisted therapy, also uh, microdosing. And let's wait till the research actually becomes much more available, but already there are very good, uh, uh, very good uh, signs that uh, juvenile therapy with microdosing, psychedelics, VR, augmented reality, uh, metaverse uh, initiatives, uh, digiceuticals instead of pharmaceuticals. Wow. There's a lot happening. So, you know, uh, this, this is a very promising field. Wow, super exciting times. I want to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing here at Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center, and we're obviously very excited to have you collaborate and look forward to working with you more. You know, what are your thoughts on incorporating non-traditional therapies, acupuncture, massage therapy, music and art therapy into the care of these cancer patients? All these therapies, by the way, have one common denominator, and they are essentially acting through vagal activation and parasympathetic nervous system activation. So they have a big role, okay? In, and not everybody will respond. People have, people have to be, you know, um, um, just like any, any treatment, people have to think it's going to help them because if, it, if they think it's not going to help them, that influences the response too. But these therapies are very important. And, you know, another thing that we're doing here at Sylvester, it's actually going to be starting in a couple months, again, really look forward to having you involved, is the survivorship program. 
it's really focused on, as we've talked about, a holistic approach to physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Do you feel like this is a model that all cancer centers should follow? Yeah, I think so. And I know that a lot of cancer centers are actually now looking into this. And uh, and I have been advising a few of them. I'd be happy to come and do a grand round sometime at your place so we can actually explore this together. Yeah. You know, every cancer, every cancer patient goes through a tumor board, but in the tumor board is mostly oncologists. And that has an advantage, but also a disadvantage because specialists only think inside their box. When you have generalists and you also have storytellers and you also have psychologists and you have even philosophers, the whole the whole approach changes to one of more broad spectrum creativity. Our specialization makes it, us very good in a certain area of our specialty, but we don't actually know much about other specialties. So to have a multi-specialty tumor board along with psychologists and caretakers and psychotherapists and even storytellers because you know every patient with a cancer has a story and we know that their story influences their prognosis i mean i feel like the issue is just education you know speaking as a physician to another physician i'm sure you would agree that we are educated in a very scientific fashion and 99% of cancer doctors don't understand the integrative medicine component. So are we just looking at a mission where we really have to educate our current physicians so they understand that it's more than just the science? Yeah, we must educate them, but we shouldn't expect them to actually become ex experts in holistic medicine. It would detract from what they do. So I think the education of cancer uh, specialist is good but then you know there's so much help available through uh, nurse educators through other people and now through AI that we should uh, not depend only on cancer specialists uh, treating cancer they're busy enough as they are and they're also very precise in what they do and we don't want to take that away from them we just not want to make sure that they have all the help needed to talk to the patient and they don't have time to talk to them so there are other people who can do that for them and be part of their team last question Deepak I know you're ultra busy give us your crystal ball view the number one breakthrough in terms of integrative medicine and cancer in the next 5 10 20 years in your opinion the number one breakthrough will be um I think immunotherapy and genetics and epigenetics, that's the breakthrough. But then with the ancillary methodologies we have, I think we will see a great future. As you and I know, cancer is not one disease, it's many, but with the genetic mapping and the epigenetic modulation that occurs with lifestyle, we can make treatment much more pleasant, much less toxic, and hopefully, uh, with the combination of gene editing, immunotherapy, and, uh, and holistic approaches, we can get rid of this disease. Deepak, always a pleasure talking to you. So inspirational how you think outside the box, really integrating Eastern and Western medicine. This is the future. Um, I just love the way that you're pushing it ahead. So Again, thanks for your time. I know you're ultra busy. Have an awesome weekend. Safe travels uh, wherever you're going. You too. And when you're when we've posted this, we'll be happy to share on our social media as well. Sounds like a plan. Thanks so much, buddy. Have a great thanks. weekend. Thanks.